the Audubon Alliance um, is a partnership between uh, Audubon Connecticut, the Connecticut Audubon Society, and the Nature Conservancy that assists the state of Connecticut with the uh, management and stewardship of our beach nesting birds. And um, you all are, are part of the Audubon Alliance, and we would not be able to do the great work that we're able to do um, without your help. So thank you all for joining tonight and uh, volunteering to be uh, beach nesting bird monitors this season. So um, my name is Corey Folsom O'Keefe, by the way, I'm the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, Connecticut, and I'm going to let the other um, Alliance staff who are on the call today introduce themselves as well. Um, going in the order that I see you, Scott, why don't you go ahead? Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. And you've probably spoken to me already, but my name is Scott Prupash. I am the Volunteer Coordinator for the Audubon Alliance for Coastal Waterbirds for the 13th season. We are always glad to have you back, Scott. Laura, what Thanks, is Corey. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Laura Saucier. I'm a wildlife biologist with the uh, Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Okay, Martha, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. I am Martha Rice, the volunteer coordinator for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and Beth? Hi everyone, I'm Beth Amendola. I'm the Senior Coordinator for Audubon Connecticut's Coastal Programs. And Matt, go ahead. Hey everybody, uh, my name's Matt. I'm a shorebird technician with the Connecticut Audubon Society. I work primarily out of Milford Point Coastal Center. Awesome, so um, you'll be seeing all these people out on the beaches at various point, uh, points this summer, along with a, a, a number of other um, sort of technicians and staff members. So um, there are, I'm going to say probably like 15 staff members who are sort of helping to run the Audubon Alliance. So um, we all, all definitely try to get out on the beaches over the course of the summer. So hopefully we will be bumping into some of you. So, um, so I uh, here is the agenda for tonight's call, or let me get that brought up. Here we are. So um, we just did our wel welcome and introduction. Uh, next, I'm gonna pass it over to Laura, who's gonna talk about piping clover, natural history and behavior, um, information about lease turns too, and shorebird management, best practices and field work, and being a good witness. Then um, I'll tell you guys a little bit about American oyster catchers, natural history, and our reporting bands. And then Scott is gonna go into the nitty gritty of data reporting and scheduling. And then we will um, take the time to answer any questions you guys have at the end. Um, if Just before I pass it over to Laura, um, if you can put your name in the chat, uh, that would be helpful to us. And then um, I'm gonna keep everybody uh, except the presenter muted while we are doing the presentation. Um, but if you have a question, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. And then at the end of each sort of person's part of the presentation, so when Laura's finished, um, if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand and then we'll take a couple of questions um, between Laura's presentation after my part and then after Scott's part. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Laura. Laura, you're muted. Thanks. After four years. <laughs> um, all right. The top. Okay. Uh, are you seeing my screen, folks? Can you Looks me, great. Give me a heads up. Thanks. Okay. So again, I said, uh, my name is Laura Saucier. I'm a wildlife biologist here at Connecticut DEP. And I run the uh, piping plover and lease term project here at the state with uh, thankfully lots and lots of uh, help from my conservation partners who you've just all met. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about um, these two shorebirds. Okay. So my presentation objectives are to go over the life history of these two birds, uh, how we manage for them in Connecticut, and a little bit about how to monitor for these birds. 
So the uh, piping plover, um, its conservation status here in Connecticut is that it's a, it is a federally threatened species, which means that it's a species that is on the, uh, is protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act. It is also a state threatened species here in Connecticut. So we recognize that the as a federally listed species, but also at the state level, um, also as a threatened species. As you can see, it was listed by the federal government in 1986 and by the state in 1992. A little bit about um, piping plovers is that there's three populations of this bird, and we manage these three different populations a bit differently. And so it's all the same species of birds, but these birds have different migratory pathways and they nest in different parts of the United States. So we have all the numbers that I'm going to be talking about today are from uh, the Atlantic coast population of piping plovers, but there's also a population that nests on the Great Lakes. And then there's also one that nests on the Northern Great Plains. And those birds are nesting primarily on like sandbars in major rivers like the Missouri River. So how did we get here? <laughs> um, so how did this, uh, this bird end up on, you know, not only the federal list, but the state list, but um, it was deemed to be uh, once a common summer visitor here in Connecticut. And um, we noticed that populations were declining. And the reasons for these decline are the first one was unsustainable harvest for the hat making industry. You know, all the fashionable ladies in Europe had in here uh, had these fantastic hats um, that uh, utilized a lot of uh, feathers and apparently in this photo, the entire bird. Um, two other reasons for the decline of this species is shoreline development and human disturbance during the breeding season. So number one is really no longer an issue because we have uh, wildlife laws now that regulate harvest or protections, um, but shoreline development is uh, still an issue and human disturbance is the number one issue here in Connecticut for this bird. So in 1986, when it was listed on the federal government's endangered species list, there were only 553 pairs that bred on the entire Atlantic coast. So we're talking maritime Canada down to North Carolina. So how do you recover a species, a species that's declined so much that we're, we have it listed on uh, endangered species lists? Well, US Fish and Wildlife Service deems that recovery for this species means that there should be about 2,000 pairs along the Atlantic coast breeding, and specifically 625 pairs breeding throughout New England, and those 625 pairs need to have a five-year average productivity of one and a half chicks produced per pair. And I use the term fledged in this bullet here. Um, fledging is just a, a term that we use for a chick that survives to the point where it can start flying. So this is, you know, 1.5 chicks that have uh, that are old enough to fly produce per pair. So um, here in New England, we're doing pretty well. So currently the state of Massachusetts has, you know, well over that 625 breeding pairs, um, just merely on its own. And Connecticut's mm -hmm. 10 year average for um, the number of piping plover pairs nesting on our beaches is about 53. And we've kind of, we consider um, our recovery goal, which means um, my goal is to have a minimum of 40 pairs um, breeding successfully here in Connecticut. 
So we're doing well. So a little bit about the Endangered Species Act of 1973. For those um, that don't know, the purpose of this act was to protect and recover imperiled species in their ecosystems. <laughs> so a little bit into the minutia of um, government speak, uh, but for every species listed under the Endangered Species Act, there needs to be a plan for how this species is recovered. So I talked a little bit about recovery in the previous slide, but um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service creates like a cookbook for how we recover these species. And a lot of, a lot of that cookbook I will discuss later on when I talk about man how we manage for these birds. But the whole point of this act is to prevent take of this species. And take is defined as the unlawful, um, actually it is, um, defined as to hunt, harass, hunt, shoot, wound, trap, kill, capture, or collect, or any attempt to do so. Um, so this bird, you know, has legal protections under this act. Um, those protections, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on what, depending on your opinion, um, you know, it has limited authority on private property. And um, the most effective way that this act is used is when you have a federal or state nexus, and basically meaning there's federal, in federal involvement through permits or funding or whatnot. In those cases, then we can really um, be as protective as we would like to be. But on private property, it's a little bit different. But um, my agency works with other state agencies towns, landowners, federal agencies, volunteers, academics, NGOs, and all of us um, are working together to protect endangered shorebirds. So what is piping plover and least turn habitat? Um, Connecticut has about 80 miles of its preferred habitat, which is this very narrow ribbon of sandy habitat. And um, that narrow ribbon is highly developed and it is intensively utilized with many uh, competing user groups. All you have to do is visit a beach in Connecticut and you'll, you'll see what I mean. So piping plovers, they're back. So they arrive, um, I have here late March, but actually it's earlier than that, but um, so these birds are migratory. So they breed here along the Atlantic coast and then they migrate out and they are spending the winter in South Carolina, the Gulf Coast, Florida, um, Bahamas, lovely places to spend the winter. And these are Sandy Beach habitat specialists. These birds, um, males and females have different plumages. They look fairly similar, but the males tend to have a a darker black neck collar and the females will have, they will also have a neck collar, but it tends to be, um, it's not, it's typically not um, a complete collar. It will, it will be uh, less, less dark than the males. So these birds are returning in March and they are nesting by mid, mid April these days. So, their nests are in, very cryptic. Um, and actually, real quick, my whole point of this big red circle here is to kind of highlight that these birds are cryptic, uh, cryptically colored. Um, they are relying on camouflage to avoid predators, to avoid, you know, anyone who's, who's on the beach. They're just looking to blend in to avoid predation. So moving on to the eggs, the eggs are also um, cryptically colored. They look very much like sand. They're easily stepped on. Um, but interestingly, a lot of people, when they think about birds, they think about robins that, you know, take grasses and weave these beautiful nests. Uh, piping plovers, they are basically just kicking a depression in the sand and they're utilizing the sand as their nesting material. So. 
Um, they make these little shallow nest cups and they lay their four eggs in, the, in those cups. So um, incubation is delayed until all four of those eggs are laid. And uh, the reason for this is that once they hatch, they kind of all hatch around the same time versus like an eagle, which will, you know, lay multiple eggs, but they'll start incubating, you know, from the get-go in that, you know, first laid egg ends up being quote unquote older than the others. So there's a bit of a evolutionary advantage to, um, to that, well, to both, depending on how you view it. But incubation duties are shared by both the male and the female, and those eggs will hatch in about 27 days. So after those 27 days, um, the chicks will hatch and they are precocial chicks. So they are like horses, they're up and going as soon as they dry off and they stay with their parents through the summer and often right through migration. So these birds fledge, like I said earlier, um, fledging is that a bird that's achieved development up to the point where it can fly in about 28 days. So you've got 20, 27 days of incubation, 28 days until the bird can fly, the bird is able to fly. So once those chicks are hatched and um, staying with their parents, they spend a lot of time foraging in the rack the first few days. Beach rack is incredibly important for these small chicks uh, in the first days of life. Um, so beaches where the rack is cleaned, you know, once or twice a day. Um, it's a bit problematic for these birds to find the food they need to develop um, on those beaches. But the birds are basically picking invertebrates that they find in that rack line. So on to least terns. A very cool species. Um, so this bird is state threatened here in Connecticut. Um, and it's federally listed, but only the interior population of it. So like uh, piping plovers, there are multiple populations of this bird. There's the Atlantic coast population of least terns. And then there is the interior population, which are birds that are you know, along Great Lakes and along those big river sandbars. But it's just the interior one that is um, feather listed. We, they are still plentiful enough here on the Atlantic coast that they have not yet warranted um, being listed on the federal list, which is great. So these birds are arriving a little bit later than piping plovers, so they're arriving in early May. So usually by the time they get here, a lot of times piping plovers are either incubating well, usually they're incubating. And these birds, these are colonial nesters. They nest in, in groups. And, and they like to nest in the same sandy habitat that piping plovers nest in. That uh, open sand, sparsely vegetated beach sand is what they settle down in. And sometimes they will settle right around incubating piping plovers. So least turn nests, like the piping plover, um, you know, the nests are cryptic. The eggs are sand colored and those chicks, as you can see in this uh, picture on the right, you know, that chick just blends right in with the sand. Again, just looking to avoid predation. The adults have enough uh, defenses where they're not like piping plovers, where the adults are also looking to blend in least turns are a little bit more assertive. So least turns, unlike the piping plover, are altricial, basically meaning that the parents are caring for those chicks. They're feeding them. They're bringing food to them. And least turns are incredibly protective of their nests and chicks. The <laughs> chicks will... Um, use beach vegetation, not the thick stuff, but you know, those sparsely, sparse patches of, of beach grass. Um, they, they will hide and seek shade during like the really hot times of summer. They're just trying to avoid 
being eaten by by gulls or whatever predator may be perusing the beach. So speaking of predators, um, predation is a big conservation challenge here in Connecticut. Um, we have a lot of predators on our beaches and you know everything likes to eat a plover and a turn. Um, plover and turn chicks, I should say. So we kind of um, consider predators in two different buckets. You have kind of your natural predators, which are, you know, your foxes, your gulls, um, peregrine falcons, that sort of thing. And then you have your human subsidized predators. So these are the predators being lured in onto beaches due to um, what humans leave behind. So, you know, garbage, food, items, that sort of thing. So raccoon skunks, house and feral cats, and pet dogs um, are all problematic to uh, piping plovers and least terns. So, you know, back to the human subsidized predator, uh, a conservation challenge here in Connecticut is, is garbage. You know, that garbage um, attracts those predators and it also poses entanglement hazards um, like fishing line and uh, balloon ribbons and that sort of thing. So um, trash is a problem on the beaches as well. Another conservation challenge are dogs. Um, leashed or unleashed, dogs are perceived as predators by shorebirds. Um, they do not view someone's pet dog any different than they would a fox or coyote. So most beaches in Connecticut, thankfully, have regulations about minimizing dogs on beaches during that breeding season. But unfortunately, there's a, a culture of lack of enforcement of these rules on our beaches. Um, and, you know, when we stop and talk to people to remind them about the rules or ask them if they can get their dog under control, people are often very defensive about it. It's, it's really not, um, yeah, it, it's not fun sometimes to remind people of rules. They get, they get their back up. So, um, piping plover management in Connecticut. Um, since 1984, my agency has been uh, intensively monitoring piping plovers. We work uh, Greenwich to Groton, so statewide, and there's usually about 13 to 16 nesting beaches. As I mentioned before, there's lots of competition between how people want to recreate on the beach and um, birds trying to nest on the beach. So our Funny enough, um, our number one tool for protecting these birds is uh, what we call string fencing or psychological fencing. And it's basically wooden stakes and we wind um, twine between the stakes. And we do that usually at the beginning of April. And the whole point of this um, stake and twine fencing, you know, it's not going to keep anyone out of that area, but we're, what we're trying to do is identify the kind of critical parts of the beach that these birds are utilizing to nest. Um, and, you know, one of the, one of the things I've told people is that not only is the string fencing protecting the birds, but it's protecting the people from inadvertently stepping on eggs or chicks, because again, the, the eggs are cryptic, the chicks are cryptic, and um, we've had a couple of cases of people inadvertently stepping on and, and killing chicks or eggs. So I put that spin on it. <laughs> um, but the whole point is to limit the amount of disturbance in that kind of ribbon of habitat that those birds are spending most of their time uh, defending territories in. So this fencing also creates a buffer between beachgoers and um, the incubating birds, which 
if people get too close to those birds, they tend to get stressed out and hop off the nest. And when they hop off the nest, then that nest is, um, you know, unprotected, if you will. A gull can come down and, and grab those eggs or a, a fish crow, crow could come down and grab those eggs while the parent is off responding to, you know, someone getting too close to the nest. So nesting beach management is dictated by species specific behavior of um, piping plovers or least terns. So for piping plovers, um, these birds, if you are familiar with piping plovers, you'll, you'll probably know what I mean. Um, but as you walk these beaches um, this spring and summer, you'll see what I mean about this. Piping plovers spend a lot more time walking on the beach than they do flying. And piping plovers have this behavior of escorting um, people or predators out of their territory. So now their territories, you have this ribbon of habitat and the birds will, a pair, typically a male will stake out this territory. And then um, you'll see that there are territories all the way down the beach and the birds are protecting their territory from not only other piping plovers, but you know other, other animals that might be getting too close. Um, so piping plovers will also use uh, a broken wing display, which um, if you haven't seen that, it's basically a behavior where the, the adults will act like they have a broken wing. They'll flutter on the ground and drag a wing behind them. And the whole kind of thought process behind that is that they're trying to lure you if they, if you are what they're responding to. They're trying to lure you away from their chicks or their eggs by um, kind of looking like a, an easy snack for a predator. So eh, you could have these four eggs or you could have this, you know, adult, which is obviously gonna have more nutrition for a, a predator than just a couple eggs. So um, for piping plovers, we found that the hatch rate, the, excuse me, the, um, we have more success with, bird, with eggs hatching if we put what we call a nest exposure around that nest. As I mentioned before, there's tons of predators on our beaches and these nest exposures we found keep most of the predators away from eating that nest. So it's really just the state that um, is putting up nest exposures. We are um, waiting until the fourth egg is laid. And then what we'll do is put a circle of metal fencing with some bird netting on top. And we're going to sink that fencing down to keep uh, digging predators, things like skunks and foxes, um, keep them from being able to get under that fencing. Um, so the mesh size for this fencing is big enough for the adult plover to walk in and out of. So the birds can come and go as they need to, but um, that fencing pretty much keeps out uh, larger predators. It does not, however, keep out things like rats or weasels. So those are still problematic on some, some beaches. But if you see one of these closures, typically, the nest is right smack in the center of it. Um, we do acknowledge that putting a nest exclosure around a nest is stressful for the adults, but it really increases our um, hatch rate success um, exponentially. It's huge. Uh, you know, we get 96% hatching of a nest um, when there's an exclosure versus like 33% if there's no exclosure. And we selectively use this on beaches. We don't do it to every nest because there are um, 
different reasons for why we put them where we do, but um, sometimes two predators are, you know, they're smart. And we've, we have had some beaches that where predators have learned that, oh, a ex nest exclosure means food and they will actually target nest, af nest exclosure after nest exclosure digging under. So um, we use it when we think it'll be successful. So that nest exclosure, um, it's really just protecting the eggs. Once those eggs hatch, these chicks do not recognize that exclosure as any sort of protection at all. Once they're up and going, they do not return to nest exclosures. So typically we take them down once the birds hatch. But um, once these birds hatch, they are uh, highly susceptible to being stepped on, um, predated, um, until they can fly. Like that, that 28 days um, after chicks hatch is just precarious um, because uh, it's just crucial. Once they can fly, they can, they can tend to get out of the way of people and predators, but until they, until they can, um, it's a long 28 days. So these terns are different than piping plovers in that, you know, these terns are not really walking the beach. They're, they're flying in, they're flying out, kind of like fighter, fighter jets. Um, so we don't do anything really for least turns. We'll use some string fencing to kind of delineate critical nesting areas for the birds once they set up shop. But anything like metal fencing, like we use for piping plovers, becomes an obstacle for them. So we don't really expose for least turns. Um, and, you know, least turns, because they are so feisty and because they are colonial nesters, they tend to, um, uh, they're pretty good at protecting them, themselves and, and their own. So they, uh, they uh, I guess, can take care of themselves. But um, <laughs> so again, least turns, uh, they are protective of their, their nests and their chicks. And um, they will dive bomb you if you're too close. They may poop on you if you're too close. They may th throw up on you if you're too close. They really um, are not shy about letting you know when you're too close to their nests or their chicks. So if this is what you're seeing, um, it means that you are too close to a, a least turn nest, so you should back away. So, um, you know, all that said, we do sometimes set up least turn fencing, which is basically we have in an area where we're pretty sure that least turns will set up shop, we have been known to put up a large section of fence. It's incredibly labor intensive. And um, so we don't always have the, the manpower or will to, to put it up. But um, as you can see this top right photo here, if that area was not fenced off for lease turns, there, you know, people would be all over it. So it does serve a purpose in that sense. All right, so another one of the um, the management tools that we have for these two birds is monitoring. So why is it so important? Number one, um, folks that monitor, whether it be staff or volunteers, um, are collecting data for us. Um, and it also gives this uh, presence of enforcement. You know, we're none of us are um, police officers and we don't enforce things, but I think it does send a message to people on the beach that if there's people out there that care about these birds, they're looking for these birds, they're protecting these birds, I think it, um, it sends a message. And folks that are out monitoring for us, you folks are my eyes and my ears. Um, you know, there's myself and I have uh, two seasonal technicians who you will meet, one is One's name is Rebecca Foster and the other is Jen Healy. They'll be out in the beaches all spring and summer. Actually, they have been on the beaches. Um, but, you know, there's really only three of us. 
um, you folks are the ones that are, again, my eyes and ears, you're providing education out there. You know, some people only visit the beach once a year and don't know anything about, you know, shorebirds or that these birds actually nest on the ground. You know, this is always a learning opportunity um, for some folks. And you folks are also fly monitoring. You're providing that enforcement presence and protection during busy holiday weekends and special events like fireworks events and that sort of thing. And the reason that Connecticut's been so successful over the years is, and we're meeting our recovery goal most years is because we have an enthusiastic, experienced and extensive monitoring network. So again, we have staff, volunteers, um, and we're all banding together to try and protect these birds and have them come to Connecticut, raise their families, and raise their families successfully on our beaches. So a little bit about monitoring. So we, we plan to have a field portion um, for folks that have never done um, bird monitoring or if they have limited experience with, with it. We'll have a field um, day. We'll let you know uh, when and where it'll be. But um, just so if this is the first time you've done this, you're not freaking out about this, we'll walk you through it on a field day. But so how how is monitoring done? It basically requires walking the beaches, looking for piping plovers, and you're doing that under good weather conditions only. If it's too hot or too cold or raining, you should not be out there because we don't want the birds um, experiencing any more uh, human disturbance than needed in those, you know, hot or poor condition days. So while you're out there, you're going to be making sure the signs that we have up and our string fencing are um, up and adequate. Sometimes they get vandalized. So um, if you see it and report it to us, we can get it fixed faster. You'll be checking on the location and activity of piping plover pairs, and you're gonna be counting the number of chicks that you see as you walk the beach. And um, please stay out of the string fencing. Monitoring is pretty much done um, outside the string fencing. Um, because we want to avoid the the circus effect of, you know, if you folks are going into the string fencing, then the people that are um, around think that it's okay to go into the string fencing. So we just want to set a good example for everyone um, while we're out there. As I mentioned before, uh, terns and plovers have very specific behavior when they when you get too close to their their chicks or their eggs um, again piping plovers are doing a broken wing display for too close least turns are dive bombing you so is there is there a piping plover escorting you down the beach and out of its territory is are they exhibiting the broken wing display um, these are all things that you're going to learn and also are going to cue you into um, what part of the beach these birds um, deem important, like their territory. And obviously, the more you do this, um, the easier it gets. And, the, and um, you'll see all these behaviors while you're walking the beaches. So in Connecticut, we don't close down beaches. You know, some states, um, in order to have these birds be successful, um, towns or state or whatever may close down a beach. And that's a very, ends up being kind of an unpopular thing, obviously. That's where the piping plovers taste like chicken bumper stickers came from. People being upset about beaches being closed down for the birds. Connecticut, we don't close beaches. We really want to um, have a share of the beach philosophy, you know really um, 
reminding, just reminding people, respecting the signs and fenced off areas, um, reminding people what the dog regulations are, talking about the birds positively. Again, for, think about that family that only gets to the beach once a year. It's a learning opportunity for them. And uh, really the message um, that I like to get out there is that all these birds need is just a little time and space to raise their families. And it tends to be resonate, certainly if you're talking to, a, if you're there talking to a family. So um, I think I'm running behind, so I'll wait for um, questions at the end. Um, I'm gonna go oh, right in, into being uh, guidelines for being a good witness. So while you're out there on the beach, you may see some bad behavior. And um, I was not able to get um, any of our environmental conservation officers to um, speak tonight, but I just wanted to pass on uh, guidelines for being a good witness, which is basically collecting the information that can be given to law enforcement should there be um, something bad that happens on the beach. So um, all of this information that I'm gonna go over is going to be in your training packet. So you don't have to write any of this down. We'll make sure you have, we'll make sure you have this. So obviously if you see something happen, um, do not put yourself in a dangerous situation. If you're in danger, please call 911. If you're safe and you suspect that a person may be responsible for destroying or harassing adult piping plovers or lease terns, nests, and their chicks, please contact my agency's uh, law enforcement branch, which is the Environmental Conservation Police, and their phone number is right here. You will have that phone number on your badges and in your information packet. While you're there, um, in theory, waiting for the police to respond. Um, if you could fill out the inc incident observation report um, to kind of be able to put all that, those details in that may help law enforcement, that would be great. When you get home, please shoot me an email to let me know that an issue happened and if or how it was resolved. That really helps me kind of be on top of what's going on out there. And again, um, none of us are law enforcement. So always consider your safety uh, to be paramount. Like safety first is the highest priority. Um, be safe. So in your training packet will be this incident observation report. Um, be sure to take a copy of it when you go out and do your monitoring. So what's on that incident observation report? It's asking questions, you know, if there's a vehicle, vehicle involved, how did you um, describe the vehicle? You know, color, make, license plate number, et cetera. Description of the people that you see um, that are engaging in this bad behavior. The date and time of day is uh, incredibly important. Uh, locations and distances, um, being able to describe the area and um, how far away the incident may have happened um, is important. And there's an example here. The individual walked within five feet of an area, closed sign and proceeded um, into that closed area. Um, weather conditions, um, it can, be important um, when considering uh, visibility and the uh, and how certain actions or events are described. Uh, please um, write things in long form. Give us details. Um, it's all really important for law enforcement. And certainly, if you see someone um, that's like harassing the birds or stepping on. Um, nest, you know, don't, don't go in that string fencing, don't disturb the crime scene, take pictures. If you have your phone, which you probably should for safety reasons, please take pic as many pictures um, 
as you think is prudent. Um, as I mentioned before, people sometimes, you know, people want to recreate how they want to recreate. And oftentimes um, reminding people of, you know, there being chicks in the area or that their dogs should be on leash or anything like that. Um, sometimes people get hostile about it. So if that situation arises, you know, diffuse the situation um, by identifying yourself as a volunteer piping plover monitor, explain what you're doing, that you're observing the birds and collecting data. If they have any questions, they can call DEP law enforcement. Um, and as a volunteer, I need to remind you that you can relay beach regulation information, things like whether dogs are allowed on beaches or not, um, or areas that are, uh, I say closed and open, I'm basically talking about areas that are string fenced or not string fenced. Um, so you can relay information to people, but never attempt to physically confront anyone, um, verbally give commands or demand personal information from anyone. Um, again, none of us are law enforcement. And certainly, um, going back to this, if you if you run into someone who's just a cranky pants, doesn't want to hear from you or whatever, just I say have a good day and walk away. Um, you letting us know that you've got you dealt with someone who was um, less than helpful. Um, again, you're the eyes and ears out there. For what's going on in our beaches. Um, and one quick thing, if you are out there um, on the beaches, you may run into or you may see, depending on how good your optics are, piping plovers that have bands on their legs. If you do see that, please let us know. Um, and if you if you got a really good camera and can take a picture, even better, because sometimes those the colors on the bands. Um, sometimes, you know, orange looks yellow and green looks blue. If you can get a picture, great. Um, thanks. And again, I think I might be running late here, Corey, but. Um, You've got three more minutes, Laura. Um, there was one question in the chat on reporting dead birds. Uh, mm -hmm. which Scott answered. He said that Reporting of any dead birds um, should be focused on our four focal species, piping plover, American oyster catcher, least tern, and common tern. Um, you know, if you see other species, please do note it and report it in your sort of typical data yeah. report or shoot a quick email to ctwaterbirds at gmail.com. Does that sound good to you? Perfect. <laughs> okay, Fabulous. great. Um, okay. Any yeah. other questions for Laura? We got Carolyn has a question. Carolyn, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. thanks. Uh, very good uh, presentation. I had a, a question. You mentioned earlier that it's easy to step on the eggs. If that happens to um, birds ever lay another clutch, if it's within a certain time, they will. Yep. Um, the piping plovers, um, we have, they will re nest if they lose uh, a clutch of eggs to, you know, predation. They typically within a week or so, they'll start laying eggs for another nest. If that nest gets predated, gets eaten by something, they may try and lay another nest. Or sometimes they may just be like, all right, this is um, too much, too much predation or too many predators or too much disturbance. And they may just leave and find another beach and try and re-nest there. Or we've had situations too where we think the birds have just left the area just um especially if it's later in the in, in the summer some of these birds will just kind of give up and migrate early so yeah up to typically up to three times renesting and then it's either too late in the season or they give up Okay, there was one more uh, question about uh, what color bands mean. Um, so I did put an answer to that in chat. Color bands are basically like bracelets for birds. 
um, that you can find on their legs. Um, and they uh, sometimes different color combinations um, will help us be able to identify individual birds. Um, or uh, sometimes there'll be a certain color that's used for a certain state or a certain location. Um, you know, some of you, if you're monitor monitoring its Sandy Point, you might see a pink flag 2E, which is a <laughs> piping plover that has been coming back for many years now, but it was originally banded in the Bahamas, and that's what oh. the pink color is. It sort of indicates that this was a Bahama banded bird. Right. And, and the whole point of those bands are for people to report them. You know, they're, they're no, there's no point in banning a bird unless someone is reporting that information to um, the bird banding lab, which is the, um, which is the, the group that kind of keeps tabs on all of the bands that are out there. Great. Were you next or were we going to Scott's I think working. I'm next because I'm going to kind of quickly cover oyster catcher, um, Let me stop natural sharing. history, and then uh, we'll pass over to Scott. So I do see we have a, a couple hands raised. Um, I think Abby, and I thought I saw Jacqueline. So maybe while I'm pulling my screen up, if uh, Abby, you want to unmute and Laura can answer your question, then I'll get my screen prepared. Okay. Thanks, Corey. Hi, Laura. Um, hey. I have a couple questions. So I, I monitored last year and something that I struggled with is identifying the nests, especially on my particular beach, how on earth, <laughs> um, yeah. but then, uh, and to also peg on top of that question, talking about identifying nesting pairs. I know it says in the form we can, um, base that off of exhibiting pairing behaviors. So can you describe also what that, what some of that could look like? Yeah, so it's not easy. Um, and uh, people like Rebecca are, you know, she's a whiz at figuring out um, which pair is which on, on these beaches. But um, if you're monitoring, you know, like once a month or something like that, we wouldn't necessarily expect you to know who's who. Like if there's a beach where there's five pairs of piping plovers um, and if you monitor it, um, frequently enough, you'll start to kind of get, okay, this, there seems to be a pair that's territorial uh, at the beginning of the beach. And okay, there seems to be a pair that's territorial, like mid beach, you know, they, they kind of, once they kind of create, identify their own territory, um, it gets a little bit easier for you to kind of figure out who's, which pair is which. Um, in early in the season when, um, you know, the males show up early and they kind of stake out their territory. The females come and the females will kind of choose um, choose their mates and territories, however they do that. But, um, you know, th there's definitely um, some kind of advantage for the males to show up early and stake out the best part of the beach um, and, you know, invest time and energy keeping other plovers out of it, out of there. Um, so that they can, um, you know, a, a bait can select them and they can uh, do their thing. But um, as far as, um, sorry, um, let's see, did I answer your question? I'm, I'm getting lost in my own head here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's helpful because it, I mean, it definitely, I definitely got a sense of you know, who's together and it was kind of a hunch and it's helpful to hear you say, yes, like you, what I'm kind of hearing is you can go off that hunch and assume because you've seen these two together. It, I, it's, it's hard. I want to say, I can see that female on a nest, that male is right next to her. Therefore that's a mating pair, but it kind of mm -hmm. sounds like I can go off the hunch of, I see these two together frequently. They're around the same area. Check that's a nesting pair. Yeah, and if it's um, a beach with multiple pairs, we sometimes end up hanging up like a number one or a number two on the fencing mm -hmm. close to their territories, which, you know, not only helps us, but helps um, other folks too when they're out monitoring. Um, so we'll try and do that to, to help people out. Um, and also once the chicks start hatching, you'll start seeing, oh, okay, that's the pair that has the older chicks. And, um, and especially once the chicks hatch, you know, they're kind of all over the beach and um, it's definitely more difficult to figure out who's who once 
the chicks are hatched. But um, again, you end up kind of queuing on the age of the chicks and figuring out, um, again, who, who belongs to. It is better if you go to a beach kind of more than once a month because you'll, you'll get a handle on, you know, who's territorial where and all that. Okay, um, Jacqueline, do you have a quick question? Um, if you find a nest and it doesn't look like it has any activity, you watch it all day, but you still see no activity and it's just a nest with like four lone eggs, what should you do? Okay, in that situation, um, so that could be one of two things going on there. One could be that that nest may be abandoned. Sometimes if a piping plover pair experiences um, harassment by predators or um, people getting too close to it, they may just kind of be like, okay, this is not a good place to nest and they will abandon that nest. The other situation might be if you're watching this nest and you're not seeing the adults going back to it, you may want, you may yourself may want to move away because maybe those birds are staying away from it because of your behavior. So if I'm not sure, I'll move away from that nest, you know, further down the beach and use my binoculars to look um, just to be sure it's. Oh, Laura, you muted. Oh my goodness, I muted myself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, it, you always have to kind of question whether you're the one that's keeping the bird away from their nest. So good question. Thank you. Okay, I think we will move on at this point. So um, you guys have heard a good amount about piping plovers and lease turns from Laura, but there are possibly three more species that you might see that we would like you to collect data on. Um, one of them is the American oyster catcher. Um, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, but you might also see common terns and very possibly, and possibly, but but possibly unlikely would be black skimmers. So uh, common terns are about twice the size of least terns. So if you're at a beach that has least terns, you know, when you see one that is substantially bigger and has a much more orange bill, um, that would be a common tern. Um, common terns are mostly nesting on offshore islands, but they will occasionally nest on the mainland. Um, and then the other species that it's a possibility you might see would be black skimmer. And this is a species that mostly nests to our south. Um, there are much larger colonies of black skimmers on Long Island, um, but we do occasionally have a couple of birds show up in Connecticut. Um, and uh, black skimmer is a, a pretty cool looking bird. They're lower jaw is larger than their upper jaw and they will hang their lower jaw down into the water and skim skim the surface of the water looking for little fish. So if you see one of those, you you will know it. Um, it'll be a pretty striking, obvious bird. Um, but uh, black skimmers are fairly rare. Common terns mostly are nesting on the offshore islands. You might see them a couple of times on the mainland beaches. Um, but a bird that you definitely will see on the mainland beaches is the, the American oyster catcher. So American oyster catcher, um, you know, similar to piping plover and least tern is a state threatened bird species. The North American population size is about uh, 10,000 individuals. And um, in Connecticut in 2023, we had 92 breeding pairs and 23 non-breeding pairs. And uh, by a non-breeding pair, um, oyster catchers take a couple of years to reach the point where they are ready to breed. Um, so if but they will start to pair up before they make their first nesting attempt. Um, so a non-breeding pair is typically a young pair that hasn't made a nesting attempt yet. Um, or it might mm. be a pair that we just, uh, maybe they're on an offshore island that we're not able to get to as frequently. And it might've been that they nested and failed and we were never able to sort of see a sign that they were breeding. So, um, but um, 92 breeding pairs and 23 non-breeding pairs is uh, actually quite an increase um, over the last 10 years. We started monitoring oyster catchers in 2012, and it's been a 49% increase in the population uh, since then, um, to the point where um, Connecticut is in the process of uh, redoing their Connecticut Wildlife Action Plan and sort of making adjustments to the threatened endangered species list. And it's looking like um, American oyster catcher 
thanks to our efforts, is going to get um, downlisted from threatened to species of special concern. So that's a good thing. That means that their numbers are increasing and they're doing pretty well. Um, and so they don't necessarily need that threatened status anymore. Okay. Um, so American oyster catchers, uh, similar to piping plovers, um, arrived uh, earlier this month, and um, they will probably make start doing start nesting in early April, and you know continue to nest until uh, the end of August. Um, Again, similar to piping plovers, if their nest fails, um, you know, either the eggs are eaten or um, the chicks are eaten, they will re-nest. And uh, American oyster catchers can nest um, up to three times. So, uh, you know, if they, you know, try, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again is, is the motto for the American oyster catcher. Um, they incubate, uh, both parents will take turns uh, between 24 and 29 days. And um, then after that point, the chicks will hatch. And uh, oyster catchers are kind of in between piping plovers and least terns um, in that they are semi precocially So what that means is the chicks are mobile um, and downy uh, and are able to follow their parents after they hatched, uh, but they still need to be provided with food. Um, you know, an, oyster, an adult oyster catcher, as you can see in my last slide, uh, I can pop back for a second, I think, uh, has this very big long bill um, that they use to either um, hammer shells apart so be able to get into the inside or they will sort of stick their their bill into the shell and cut the abductor muscle and then it'll open up um, and that's how they'll access their food. So in order to do either, either of those things, um, you know, a bird has to have a long bill and it can take um, an American oyster chick, a, chick uh, a month or two to be able to develop that full size bill, uh, which is why they are dependent on their parents. Uh, oyster catcher chicks take um, about 35 days to reach the point of fledging so that they can fly. And similar to piping plovers, um, they do rely on, um, you know, how they do have very cryptic eggs, very cryptic nestlings. Um, these are, in this picture, this is a, a very recently hatched nest. You can see there are three oyster catcher chicks there that are also blend in very well with the sand. And like I said, it can take a while for them to grow their full size bill. Um, but um, when chicks are, you know, at, by about the time that they're ready to fledge, um, maybe a few weeks afterwards, their bull or the bill is starting to get closer to full size. In this picture, the bird in the middle is an adult, and then you can see the two birds on the left and on the right, um, those that, that have black at the tips of their bill um, are fledglings. So these are birds that are able to fly, but their, their bills still are not full size. And uh, oyster catcher chicks um, can stay with their parents for up to a year. Um, because they do have to wait until their bill grows to its full size. And then they also have to learn these various techniques for being able to feed themselves. Our oyster catchers um, are nesting on the mainland, um, but they're also nesting on islands in Connecticut. And uh, the population is spread about, uh, there are 65 nestings, there were 65 nesting sites in 2023, and 80% of those were offshore islands and 20% of them were coastal beaches. So um, this bird is perhaps a little bit more adaptable than the plover and lily's turn in that they can, you know, take advantage of, you know, little rocky islands, um, you know, they will uh, nest on beaches, and then they will forage in a variety of different habitats. Um, and as I mentioned in our first slide, uh, oyster catchers, you know, have been doing pretty good over the last um, uh, 10, 10 to 15 years. So our productivity, um, so the number of fledglings per pair was 0.87 in uh, 2023. And, um, you know, the American oyster catcher sort of recovery plan calls for a productivity of 0.6. So we are, are kind of well above the sort of uh, goal for productivity. Um, and uh, that's true, even if you look across the last 10 years, our average has been 0 0.76. So we are, um, you know, it's, it's no wonder our population is growing here in Connecticut. Um, but there are still threats that these birds face um, due to predation, um, you know, and also human disturbance. And one of the best ways to illustrate that is actually to look at um, a comparison between uh, birds that are nesting on the islands and birds that are nesting on the beaches. So um, as I mentioned previously, 76% of Connecticut's breeding population is nesting on offshore islands. Um, and the birds that are nesting on islands typically have higher productivity, um, that's the blue bars, um, than the mainland beaches uh, due to less 
human disturbance and, and less predation. Um, versus on the mainland sites, you know, where about 24% about of our, our nests are. And, um, you know, at, while productivity was, was pretty high in 2023, it was up to 0 0.59, um, you know, for the mainland beaches. Uh, overall, you know, it, most of the time the birds do better on the offshore islands. Okay. Uh, one thing that makes it easier to monitor oyster catchers um, in Connecticut is that uh, since 2018, um, Audubon Connecticut has actually been banding American oyster catchers um, with colored bands. And our bands are this nice yellow, yellow color that you can see. And um, especially on the mainland beaches, um, most of the oyster catcher pairs, at least one of the pairs is banded. Um, so it does actually make it easier to sort of tell um, what individual oyster catchers um, are on the beach that you're monitoring. I don't know why my slides keep advancing. Um, but to date, we've banded 76 American oyster catchers, and that includes 51 adult birds and 25, 25 fledglings. And uh, the purpose of the banding is to learn about the movements of these birds uh, during the season, um, also learn about mate and site fidelity, and also learn about where these birds are going uh, in the wintertime so that we can understand what stopover habitats and what wintering locations are important to them. And we have learned an awful lot. Um, we've identified three staging areas where the birds sort of meet up in the spring before they go to their nesting areas and where they meet up in the fall before they disperse to their wintering grounds. And then um, we have documented 23 instances where um, banded birds have either switched breeding sites or switched mates over the last five seasons. So. Uh, before we started banding birds, we used to think that oyster catchers were monogamous and they would, the same pair would stick together um, all the time because we'd always find the nests roughly in the same places. But once we started banding the birds, we realized there was, there's quite a bit more mate switching and, and site switching than we were able to do, real, be, that we realized than before we were able to put the bands on the birds. Um, and uh, we started banding fledglings um, roughly in 2020. And uh, one thing we've noticed is that we had a pair of birds that were uh, that fledged from Milford Point in 2020. And uh, those birds returned in 2022 um, to the staging areas in Connecticut. And then in 2023, they both made nesting attempts. So um, it's really neat to sort of start to see some of the young birds that we've been able to band actually start to return and nest here in Connecticut. And uh, one of the most exciting um, things that we learned from banding uh, most recently is a uh, the, I think this is the first American oyster catcher sighting ever in Colombia, but one of our birds showed up in Colombia in November. So um, it's a, it, I was looking at the range map on the first slide I showed and it doesn't have Colombia on there. <laughs> so now we know that oyster catchers go to Colombia too. So um, when, when you guys are out monitoring, you know, if you see uh, oyster catchers that have these um, yellow um, field readable bands on them, um, definitely do include that information um, in your reports that you'll be submitting, um, you know, uh, to Scott. And um, you can also report bands to the uh, American Oyster Catcher Working Group website, which is amoywd.org. And, uh, you know, if you are going to a beach fairly regularly, let's say every two weeks, we don't need you to report necessarily every two weeks that you saw yellow band N62. Um, but certainly at the beginning of the season, and then maybe the last time you saw that bird at the end of the season, um, would be helpful information to know. And then also, um, you know, during the month of, of March and April, when birds are still passing through Connecticut, um, you know, we never know what birds might show up. Um, oyster catcher banding is a, a coastwide effort. So we definitely have birds that were banded in Georgia. We have birds that were banded in other states that passed through Connecticut. Um, so in the spring, so March and April, and then again um, in September, birds can be passing through from other states, and it's really valuable to us to be able to collect information on different banded birds. So um, when you're out on your beaches, get to know the birds that are banded that are on your beaches, but then also always keep your eye out for other banded birds, and uh, be sure to report those um, to Scott, and um, you are welcome to report them to the American Oyster Catcher Working Group as well. Okay. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm glad to take a question or two um, before, uh, and then Scott will continue on.
There's some great questions in the chat, but I see that Beth and, and Scott have already gotten to them. So um, glad, glad to thank you guys for taking care of that. There's one question and Scott, since you are an amazing photographer, I think you should answer uh, what camera lenses are best for documenting hatching, hatchlings? Thanks, Corey. Um, for the most part, we just want to keep in mind everything we're doing is hopefully very far away. So if you have a nice DSLR or a mirrorless camera or just a point and shoot, hopefully with a long optical zoom, that's good. But for our purposes, um, the more millimeters you have for long lenses, if you're shooting professional gear, the better. And if you have a full frame camera without a crop sensor, just a full big frame so you can crop even more, that helps a lot too. When you see my pictures in the presentation in a moment, um, you'll see I was shooting usually on large cameras like a D850 with a 500 millimeter lens and cropping them substantially. So the picture might be enormous, but the crop is so little in the middle. And that's because we're keeping our distance to the water line away from the birds. And just I'll touch on the next one. Um, to some degree, the birds are, um, you can discern sexes in the field. Um, females for American oyster catchers will have a little eye fleck versus males wouldn't. And things like piping plovers, it gets a little difficult, but males might have a little thicker and bolder breast band, for example. Um, but it, it can be very hard if you're, you know, just again, staying far away, looking through binoculars to properly do that. So you get the hang of it once you are out there for a while, but it's not, and you can report it as such too. You can report, um, you'll see in the forms, you can report a pair, you can report an adult and then say, well, that was, this one looks to be a female and there were a couple males, or if you don't know, you can put you for um, unknown. Scott, why don't you uh, dive into your presentation? Sure, Laura, could you click that up for me, please? Cool. But thanks everybody. And we'll get through this. And I know this has been a lot of information and we're gonna have a lot more information now, but for the most part, this is something that we can go back, review. Um, you're gonna be able to watch this presentation again. We're gonna give you a lot more documents and information. And the key part right there is ctwaterbirds at gmail.com because you can ask me usually a question whenever you need, if we can clear something up for you, um, whether it's about what you saw in the field, whether it's about data reporting, uh, policies, procedures, we're here to help you. And next, please, Laura. And we'll just touch on your responsibilities again. Uh, for the most part, we're looking to collect and observe, um, collecting data and observing piping plovers, American oyster catchers, lease turns, and common turns. And there is no particular time requirement because we want people to contribute as you as they can, certainly after everything that we went through with COVID. Uh, but we would like to ideally at least visit your beaches monthly when you're working with us, maybe a few times a week. If you're, you know, living nearby and you have the time, that's also okay. Uh, you're going to just bear in mind that you might walk potentially several miles at certain sites and have to time it out for tides and uh, weather and so forth. As Laura touched on, you're going to be reporting disturbances and problems like abandoned nests, loose dogs, excessive trash, uh, human visitation levels, signs of predation, direct threats or the takes. You're going to be educating beachgoers with kindness when they want to be because sometimes people just want to be alone and want to have their space and their time, and that's fine. And we're going to talk, if we can, about nests, young, dog leash laws, um, the importance of taking our trash with us and giving birds space. And there might be times in the year that we'll ask you if you want to come help out with uh, different events that occur, whether it's string fencing and signage, which I had sent out the dates already for, for the public dates for putting it up for the spring. I will be sending those again if you want to come out and help. Uh, the June census by CT Deep. Um, sometimes we have fireworks displays or beach cleanups and distributing literature and that sort of thing, and that you can help with as well. We just have to remember too, while we're at the beach, that we are representing all of the entities here. 
and that we have to be professional in our conduct and our appearance, wearing the CT deep badge at all times, and having a liability form that you'll receive again later on with a bunch of other documents filed with CT deep. And again, volunteering is something that you should consider separate from just going to the beach in that while we're volunteering, we don't want to be smoking or drinking or swimming or sunbathing or fishing and all those things might be fine. But again, just please on your time. Because our management and our behavior at the beach influences the public perception of wildlife management as a whole, the endangered species and the birds that we're caring about every day. And if you see those rude people who just don't care about the birds, don't want to listen to you, you know, I have a dog, we all love dogs, everybody in the team loves dogs, but dogs on the beach in the middle of breeding season is not a good thing. But sometimes if you go up to them and you say, hey, over there, you with that dog, you got to get out of here now. You, no, that's not the way to do it. Just you want to politely, kindly maybe mention the laws or mention why dogs can harm birds on the beach. That's fine. But if they're rude and they're starting to get all agitated, then just, hey, have a great day. I'll see you later and just keep walking because it's just not worth it. And while we're at a good point with COVID, thankfully, finally, for the first time in years of having this discussion, um, social distancing in people's private space is still very important. When you go out to monitor, you want to keep a few things in mind. And number one is to check the weather before you go out. If it's going to be a really ugly, nasty, rainy day, uh, it's like so many we've had recently, just a total washout, just stay home. Same for thunderstorms. Sometimes you've got snow. If it's going to be really chilly with those spring mornings, you know, and you look at, at your phone and you see it's going to be in the like, you know, low 40s tomorrow when there's already eggs on the beach. Well, it's probably a good day to stay home. And the same for later in the summer. If it's very windy, it's pushing you out over or if it's hotter than 90. And that's for your safety as well as the birds. But when you hit the field, you want to bring your CTD badge, binoculars or spotting scope, phone and notebook, any outreach materials. Um, the cameras like we talked about with a very good zoom can help a lot too just to see things and record whatever else you might want to consider sunblock water snack insect repellent a backpack or a bag a hat or jacket or gloves camera like i mentioned just because all of those things can help depending on the season especially um you know a hat or a jacket even in the you know warmest or the coldest days bearing in mind you'll go out between 40 or excuse me 50 and 90 degrees those will still help you quite a bit. And the same with wearing sneakers, strong, sturdy ones or boots. And if you're ever ill or you have an injury, it's okay, just please shoot us a message. Let me know, hey, I'm scheduled to go out tomorrow afternoon at Long Beach, but I'm really feeling under the weather or yesterday I twisted my ankle. No problem at all, just let us know. and We'll take you off that one and we'll see if you feel better for your next time. And that's an example of just what it looks like off of Long Beach going into the parking lot one day. And that's a great example of, well, I'm not going to walk down the mile long beach because even though that's out there over the water, that might be coming in here any moment. And that's an example of a piping pullover in the snow, which I don't think we're going to have this year, but some years it does happen and we have late starts and more good days to stay home. Monitoring procedures for when you get to the beach. First, before you go, you should probably check the electronic data entry form that will be sent out to everybody. It is already always in the blog at ctwaterbirds.blogspot.com. And you'll see if you review it, what you need to enter. And that's a great way to know what you need to record when you go out, which includes your name, beginning and end times, date, the beach you're at, the species you've observed out of our four, the age of the birds, the breeding status, the weather, the tide, and a few more things. But when you get to the beach, you'll want to scan it from afar, keeping yourself kind of between the water line and the upper sand, staying where the tide might hit, because that way you know you're away from any nesting areas potentially, and you'll be able to get a good view of everything that's going on. And nevertheless, especially as you get into the nesting season, you'll still want to keep an eye out for little birds in your path, because piping plovers especially can take their young down by the water get scared, breeze, hunker down in place. And that's something we want to avoid as well. Laura touched on a lot of how we want to avoid disturbing them and what to do if we see them in agitated states. So that's really important to remember. 
And it's very important to remember not to enter a streamed area for any reason, not for the birds, not to pick up that potato chip bag, not to get somebody out, not to take a picture or a better view. Just stay out of there in general, because even if you are 100% safe, and we don't do that either, even after years of doing it, if we can avoid it at all, because other people will see you doing so and think, oh, well, they went in there, I can do it too, it's fine. So we want to just stay near that area of the wet sand, not go in the dunes or any, near any nest or flush the birds off the eggs, because we don't need to count every specific nest for turns in a colony, and we don't need to count all the eggs. Um, in the chat I mentioned, when you see a piping plover exposure, you can pretty much safely assume there are four eggs and the bird is incubating them. That's a good example of that exposure. And you can see maybe, do you see the bird? It is directly between the couple, right at the bottom, sitting on four eggs. So it's beyond the string fencing. You can see the fencing with the flags more on the left against the trees silhouetted. and it's beyond the fencing, it's safe, and the people are walking below it, and all is well in the world. When we go to the beach, we want to record the focal species behavior and their breeding status, maybe a bird, a bird or a pair foraging, if you see courtship and copulation, which you may soon. Subsequently, we'll start seeing adults on nests like that, a uh, pair with chicks, or if they're fighting over territory. You adult plovers might lead you away from the nest with broken wing displays, alarm calls, and more, like Laura mentioned. And so you want to slowly, quietly, and safely exit that area along the water, kind of just staying, again, by the wet sand, just walking away slowly. Same thing if you have turns, calling, dive bombing, you know, and so forth. You're going to want to minimize the time around the eggs and the young, certainly, kind of standing where I was in that previous photo, just observing from afar so that they don't even know that you're there. And cameras and phones really help record, but be aware not only of the birds and safe ways, like we said, but the fact that many people just do not want to be photographed or recorded, especially for a prolonged time. Um, whether it's you're take, trying to take pictures of the birds or you see a disturbance and you're trying to record that, just be careful of the reaction you might get from people. That's an example of a super tiny little hatchling piping plover and you can see the size comparison to even the grains of sand on its legs and around it um, that was again shot pretty far away with a big lens and just crops severely to get all the little details in there and that's an adult who we are walking by um, again along the water but it was calling and shouting out to its young hey there's some big predators over here, so be careful. As we said, please don't count the eggs for the species or turn nests, but if you find a new nest that's outside of the fencing, you haven't seen before, um, isn't exposed in the way that we've shown, just notify AFCW and CTD via direct email as soon as possible and describe the landmarks at the location. Don't mark it in any way. Exposed nests for piping plovers are complete with four eggs and can be viewed from afar without flushing the adults. The nest is abandoned or destroyed by predators. Tell AAFCW and CT Deep by direct email as soon as you can. That's again vital information that Laura will want as soon as possible. And just keep noting predator tracks and signs if it's maybe digging under an exposure, um, sightings of fish crows sitting on them, a red fox running around the beach, the neighborhood cat that's in the dunes, or a big group of gulls. And that's, you know, what we don't want to see, but people, for the most part, <laughs> believe that these looks are just friendly little creatures. And again, we love cats. I've had cats my whole life. They're wonderful, but they have to stay inside because that's exactly what they do. And if they can do that to a cottontail, you can imagine what they can do to tiny little hatchlings or smaller pipe and plovers. And there's a red fox sitting higher up in a dune, just again, Hanging out, not doing anything, but that's something you might want to see from afar in the grasslands or or in a dune and report that to us. So keep in mind that bird paramount bird safety is paramount and data is secondary because again, if you can't see everything, if you can't tell everything, if you can't get all the info, no problem. Just make sure you have as much as you can while keeping the birds safe. 
because we are a big disturbance as well and we have to maintain a safe distance. If you see any suspicious behavior, suspected person may be responsible for destroying or harassing nests, chicks, or adults. Follow the good witness guidelines that Laura had outlined and call CT Deep NCON police. That, again, will be on the important phone number sheet and your badge. In a safe location, you want to fill out the incident observation report, which will be in the information packet and email Laura and CT Deep and AFCW ASAP. And we're not Law enforcement, we're not there to arrest, to yell, to threaten. We're just observing, educating, and relaying the information in a positive and friendly way. If the hostile situation does arise, just diffuse it as best you can with kindness, wish them well, and continue down the beach. That's an example of a piping pullover that you might observe has a pink flag on it, and that pink flag is 5E. That would be from West Haven. And that's something that you'll just report exactly as such. Oh, I saw a pinked flag piping plover. It said 5E. If you can't see it, again, you don't have to zoom in all the way to read it. Maybe you don't have um, the best picture or the best look at it, but that's fine. As much information as you can provide is great. And that same goes for N14, would be just a yellow bands on both legs and black lettering and that's an oyster catcher as you can see from very far away as images compressed and you can see a lot of beach between us he's in the fencing and, and we're outside monitoring takes place from april 1st to august 31st and our staff monitors from february to october and the greatest need is at the busiest beaches during the highest traffic times on weekends holidays the warm beach weather gets everybody to the shore, as you can see in that picture to the right, that's Milford Point. You're gonna sign up for everything the way you signed up for this um, training session, emailing ctwaterbirds at gmail.com with the requested schedule, days or, days or dates, whatever works better, maybe every Thursday morning, maybe the first, eighth, 20th, et cetera, of the month in the AM or PM. Times are great, but at least we need the AM or PM, please, and your beach selection. We want to submit the schedules ideally by April 1st. And if you need to cancel the session again, sick, you're injured, it's bad weather, something's come up in your life, by all means, just let us know at ctwaterbirds at gmail.com. You'll find the complete electronic form, as I mentioned earlier, the online data submission form on the AAFCW blog at ctwaterbirds.blogspot.com. The link is in the upper right hand column under important documents. When you view it on the computer, you might not see it on the phone, but if you view it on a computer, that'll be the best way to do it. And we'll also send you a, a, the link in email. You're gonna enter all the required fields, but leave whatever might be blank, um, such as the number of young birds right now, we don't have any, so you would just leave that blank. And there will be more documents of pertinent information, pertinent information that we'll be placing there soon. In general, if you have sure, you know, other surveys of shorebirds, turns, and long leg waders on your personal time, and you're just out at the shore at a different site that's not part of our beaches, just you're hanging out, you're going birding, you're having fun, and you see more waders or turns or shorebirds, just put in the eBird, and you can share that with us at ctwaterbirds at gmail.com via, via eBird's share function. And just please submit the data as soon as possible when you return from the beach. And you might see random sightings like to the right there, seven oyster catchers in the middle of the season from failed nests or birds that aren't nesting this year, just hanging out all together in the middle of the summer, flying by the moon in the evening. That's a royal tern. It's an example of a species that's not one of our focal species, but something you can look out for as a rare sighting. And you can add that to eBird reports or report it with your regular report, whatever you like. Monitoring locations include the priority beaches of Long Beach and Stratford, Milford Point and Milford, Sandy Morse Points and West Haven and Bluff Point and Groton. Other beaches that include monitoring are Grizzle Point and Old Lyme with a few specific protocols that are in place there for uh, the Nature Conservancy and access. Hammonasset Beach State Park in Madison, Short Beach in Stratford, Pleasure Beach in Bridgeport, Compo Beach in Westport, Silver Sand State Park in Milford. And additional beaches with birds sometimes include Sherwood Island State Park in Westport, Russian Beach in Stratford, neighboring Milford and West Haven beaches, and the Waterford Town Beach. Offshore islands and other local beaches and marshes may have birds and can be scheduled on a case-by-case -case basis, but again, our staff is largely monitoring those areas. 
And we'll just take a quick look at the beaches. There you can see Bluff Point over to Waterford Beach. That, as you can see, is Griswold Point. It's not even there because it's tough to get to with the tides now, but it's out there. That is Hammonasset, a place many people are familiar with. Sandy Morse Points are on the right in West Haven. Silver Sand State Park, a busy place for people and not so many birds, but it's still monitored. This includes from left to right Pleasure Beach and Long Beach on the mile long barrier beach between Bridgeport and Stratford, looping around to Russian Beach. Uh, the tip is Stratford Point, which does not have monitoring uh, as it doesn't have nesting birds. So it's a beautiful place to see many shorebirds. Short Beach in Stratford has some birds every year, usually now, and Milford Point is one of the best locations in the state. And that's Sherwood and Campo in Westport. And we're going to have you guys pick up your badge this year. So um, you're going to have the opportunity to go to the Connecticut Audubon Society Coastal Center at Milford Point. There are the hours and the address, the Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center. And you can also pick up a badge and a lanyard at New Volunteer Field Training on April 13th. We will be finalizing the location for April 13th field training and the time soon, and we'll let you know as soon as it's set. But it'll be a great day to come out for a couple hours to see Laura, uh, Rebecca, myself, and others. To take a walk down the beach, talk about the birds, talk about monitoring procedures, protocols, again, hand in that waiver, get your badge. It's just a lot of things all at once. And then for the most part, after that, everybody really has a terrific feel for it. Um, it's not required, but if you can go, I know it'll help you quite a bit. If you have any questions, we'll take those in a second. But in general, again, contact CTD Pencon Police immediately for, take, for takes or birds being harassed or attacked by people. And of course, 911 for any emergency. Email CTD Wildlife and AFCW at ctwaterbirds at gmail.com as soon as possible about any new nests, damage fencing, fencing or signage predated or lost nests or injured birds and email ctwaterbirds at gmail.com anytime really with anything, whether it's basic questions about scheduling, bird IDs, assistance with that, to inquire about paperwork, data entry, uh, the appropriate weather conditions for monitoring predators and people, to RSVP for fencing dates, to show us pictures or videos and so forth. And that'll end everything on our little piping pole over there. Um, so we'll take a few more questions now. I will go through some of the questions that I see here too. Just to reiterate, uh, April 13th will be to be determined. We are setting the time, date, or the time and place rather for April 13th soon. Um, we'll let you know when that's all finalized from deep. We're going to have this training, all of it. And I can put the slides up as well, but this training can be rewatched whenever you want. Corey's going to send me the video file for it, and we'll have you be able to watch it on YouTube throughout the season to refer back to. So you can just, just go right on YouTube. We'll send you the link, and you can glance through any part or all of the program again to get any questions answered. And certainly, again, I can't emphasize enough, email ctwaterbirds at gmail.com whenever you can if you have a question. Um, the badges and so forth or waivers and lanyards can be picked up at Milford Point and the Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center at any date, really. Um, I, we've had in the slides the days of the week and the times that they're open and available, but whenever they're there and the centers are open for business and staffed, you can go pick them up and we'll get them. I don't know if they're all there in place right now. No. Okay. But they will be soon. We will let you know soon when they're there. And I realize, again, it's 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 a lot to take in. That's a tremendous amount of information. And we're looking at April 1st coming soon. But just keep in mind, you know, we've had a couple days below freezing this week. It's been plenty cold. Our birds are starting to establish territories and will be nesting soon. 
but it's not a tremendous rush to get out there to the beach. Um, our past monitors who have real feel for it are getting out there and they'll be getting out there soon. We have their refresher training this week and they'll be getting out there to start. Um, our staff is already visiting the beaches, putting up fencing in different areas, getting signs going, but our birds are still all settling in and not all of them have arrived yet either. They're still coming back to the state. So it's just a lot of information and a lot going on, but we have our field training in about two and a half weeks and that'll take care of a lot. Uh, in the meantime, just if you can take a look at the beaches, um, the monitored beaches, again, that list is right there. We'll be sending you the list in email. We'll be sending you the list of documents. You can start deciding on a schedule where you might like to visit. That you can take care of with me. We'll send you the waiver form. You can get that filled out, and we'll start taking those back. We'll get the badges and lanyards distributed, so you can start picking them up. So it's just a slow, it, it seems, again, fast, overwhelming, but it's a slow process in the next couple of weeks that we'll get going because the birds really, really get kicking in their gear later in mid-April to late April, and then we start seeing nests, and then it starts going. The date for field training is April 13th, and to be determined where. Probably, if you, is it probably where I think it is, Laura, you think? Yeah, I think it's just the parking situation we need to assess. Yeah, yeah, it will probably be in West Haven, but if you know anything about West Haven and the parking, they've been, they've been doing a lot of work on streets and uh, parking lots and all sorts of things for about the past year. So hopefully when West Haven finishes paving and opens their parking lot again, if it is open in a couple of weeks, we will very likely be having it there just as a good central location in the state. Scheduling, you know, just expectations, just, you know, let me know your schedule. If it's, I can go every week, I can go once a month. This is the date, this is the day. You know, sometime in the a.m., if you want to say, oh, every morning I like to go for a walk at 8 a.m. in Milford and I want to go here, tremendous. If you can say, well, I'll do p.m.s on Thursdays over here at Bluff Point, fantastic. You just let me know. I'll take it all down. And to some degree, it's just shifting puzzle pieces. Um, we want to distribute people over time as much as we can we're going to have you know we have roughly 120 people who are interested this year we might end up with more that sounds like a lot but when you divide it out to beaches oh we have you know 12 or 14 sites that we're going we're looking to cover seven days a week from dawn to dusk and 15 people on staff might sound like a lot but again it's the entire state of connecticut and many other places that are not monitored too so it's really just about best distribution of people at the most critical locations. And if there's a little overlap, if you see another monitor, sometimes that's okay too. Laura and I can go out in the same beach right after each other and get entirely different results because maybe the birds flew over here to forage. Maybe this one was hunkered down this way and we couldn't spot them. So if you don't feel like you're doing something redundant, um, your data is important. Getting more data is good. If you miss something, that's all right. Someone else might pick it up. It's just about being seen as well by everybody out there and being known that you're there monitoring the birds, you're keeping an eye on things, you're, you know, potentially going to report it to someone if they see uh, all these people out here watching the birds and, oh, I'm going to go run my dog around. They might not do that just because you're there. Um, so it's all just, it all comes together into this kind of perfect uh, final product that ends up with us having great productivity for our birds, good education for people, and a happy ending, ideally. If there's any more questions, I will take them right now. Looks like you nailed it, Scott. <laughs> I think I think that I catch up with all of them. I think so, Corey. I think so. Um, so, uh, you know, definitely. Um, so if, if folks have questions, if you're ready to sign up for, you know, your day of the week or dates um, or site, um, c2waterbirds at gmail.com is the the website to the, the email address to email. And, um, you know, definitely we'll be in touch with the information about the field training, um, uh, where to find or uh, get or download various documents, um, you know, the link to the recording of this training. 
Um, lots of information coming your way, so stay tuned. Um, and we're excited to have you all um, helping us with our piping plover and lease turn and oyster catcher and common turn, um, you know, stewardship efforts this season. So uh, thank you guys so much for joining the training tonight. And uh, myself and Scott and Laura and Beth, and we'll probably stay on for a few more minutes as well, just in case um, there are any additional questions. But everybody have a great night and thank you. Um, just to say, so I think there is a question about uh, spotting scopes that we missed from uh, Karen. Um, just asking about the best spotting scopes for um, monitoring the birds. I've seen one above two. Yeah, there is uh, everything. I'll just say quickly is through email. You'll be receiving all the everything through email and um, emailing packets. Yes. Spotting scopes, if someone else wants to speak to that better than me, I, by all means. I would just say go with a brand that's guaranteed for life. That would be the, <laughs> the most important thing because uh, the beach is a, is a challenging environment. You know, you get sand blowing around, salt water. Uh, guaranteed for life is a very good thing. Um, we buy all of our binoculars and scopes um, from Vortex because they are guaranteed for life. What is not guaranteed for life is my 500 millimeter lens, which is currently being repaired at Nikon because there's an enormous amount of sand in it and saltwater spray on it, and it's been beaten up by going everywhere. So that is very good advice. I'll definitely echo that. Um, your your optics get pretty beat up on the beach, so don't take anything that you know you're not really ready to uh protect really well or will be too upset if it gets covered in sand or salt water yeah your phone too yeah <laughs> phone too. Well, thank you everyone in the comments for all the kind words for all of us and thank you for joining us and for participating this year and it means a lot this is what we need all the help we can get